Biobalance HealthCast, episode 136, Genetic Testing, Obesity, and Dieting. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. So welcome to the second in a series of conversations that we're having about genetic testing and the impact of the information that genetic testing can provide for people about their uh, diet issues and weight and health issues throughout their lifetime. It, it uh, is possible by doing something as, as simple as collecting spit in a vial and sending it off to the lab to get a full genetic panel uh, of what your markers are that will tell you if you are genetically predisposed, if you're genetically at risk for certain kinds of illnesses. And from that information, you can then learn. For instance, we were talking in the previous podcast about diabetes and type 2 diabetes in particular. In, in my family, there are genetic markers that say we are aggressively at risk for that. And so what that tells me and it tells my, my son and his son and so on, if those genetic markers stay true, is that we have to be responsible for what and how we eat if we want to avoid becoming diabetic. And so whether you like it or not, it's reality. And so you have to learn these things so you make better choices and responsible health choices. And so with that in mind, one of the places I'd, I'd like to start in this conversation, which is a continuation of the previous one, is about what uh, we call hunger perception. Mm -hmm. You know, how do I know when I'm hungry? How do I know when I'm full? And psychologists have done so much study in the area of hunger perception, and they've done all kinds of different things, and we'll uh, talk but never, about never some of them. did they really think they were hardwired into us. Yeah. They never started from the perception that we have a hardwired hunger mm -hmm. gene or a hardwired not hunger gene, not hungry gene, and and that runs us. They started from oh, we were behaviorally modified from ch childhood. Yeah, but you can still use behavior modification for these. Oh, you have to. I mean, it's about the only, and for some things, it's the only thing you can do is modify the behavior. So the genes that that determine probable behavior for us on the hunger perception is mm -hmm. is a gene that that gives us the hormone leptin. And leptin is a is a I feel full gene mm -hmm. or a I feel full hormone, excuse me. And uh, so so they do a, a test on the gene that that determines that part of the leptin activity. Mm -hmm. And we actually have genes. Some people have genes that say I'm never full. I'm hungry all the time. Yeah, the, the this test identifies two of those genes. One is the gene that causes you. Uh, to feel hunger, and I don't know the names of, I mean, there may be a name to this, but they, they designate initials. NMB causes you mm -hmm. to feel hunger, and FTO causes you to feel full. Right. And so leptin is apparently the switch that goes back and mm -hmm. forth. So when one of those genes is driving the bus and you feel <laughs> hunger, you go out and you eat. When you've eaten enough, the leptin that is generated triggers the other one to say, you stop feel eating. Mm -hmm. uh, are there ways to play with that to accelerate the amount of leptin or to uh, change the messaging that takes place? There's a lot of research being done on that. Yes, there There's are. A, so, so in the near future, I'm, I believe, there will be medications that can be adjusted mm -hmm. to change what's hardwired into us. But for now, we have to know if it's hardwired or not. So the, the um, hunger gene means you're always feeling hungry or you feel hungry more than other people. And if that's positive, and I have that actually, I don't know that I feel hungry all the time, but, mm -hmm. um, but that's one of my genet genetic hardwired um, characteristics. So I have an increased feeling of hunger where other people might not feel hungry, I would feel hungry and have to eat. Well, and another thing that tells you that so much of it is biochemical mm -hmm. and not just self-discipline. It's mm -hmm. not, not like they're lazy or they're unwilling to do what they need to do mm -hmm. is, I mean, if, if you know anybody that's on ADD medicine, mm -hmm. ADD medicine suppresses the hunger drive. Right. And that's exactly how we, we would handle something like this. If you can't, knowing this, if you can't change your um, activity, you can't 
schedule meals and snacks so that you don't feel as hungry. Mm -hmm. That would help. If you can't do that, then we have to use medication and we can use amphetamines, which are like the ADD medicines or diet drugs are both similar. And we could also use Victoza, which is a uh, is being tested to suppress hunger and is currently a diabetic drug. We could also use Topamax, which is um, a new diet drug that, that actually was a seizure medicine and a migraine medicine. But these and medicines we found that they decrease hunger. The medicines Kathy's talking about are prescription medicines and yeah. you need a physician. If you buy over-the-counter stuff to restrict your diet, all that's going to do, the way that that stuff works, is it inhibits your taste buds. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get the satisfaction feeling of tasting what you want to eat. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that suppresses or reduces the, the hunger drive because you don't get the payoff. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not very effective, and that's why the over-the-counter medicines don't really work for most people. So if you can't manage the hunger gene, that's why we do yeah. consultations with these so that we can actually treat things, treat these these hardwired problems mm -hmm. if we can't treat them behaviorally we try treating them with medication or both or both. you know you treat them with the medication mm -hmm. to get the window open for retraining the habit patterns i mean sometimes you the you have the working in psychology with people that have addictions or obsessive and intrusive thoughts and those kind of things one of the skills that we we try to teach them is something called thought stopping and so if you have these intrusive thoughts about a snack or something that you want to, mm -hmm. to consume that's not good for you, you have to teach yourself to consciously stop thinking about it and learn to switch and think about something else. Uh, so that instead of sitting here and seeing my refrigerator <laughs> in my mind's eye and seeing that big slab of chocolate cake, well, you know, I'm trying to study for a final exam, I'm trying to read. The first and, problem and I keep, is having the chocolate cake in your house. Well, that's behaviorally <laughs> one of the changes that you have to make, mm -hmm. absolutely. But to help people get there, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you can't just go home. They, they do that sometimes. I mean, some of the TV shows you watch about little kids with these incredible eating disorders uh -huh. where they crave food, they have to lock the cabinets, they have to keep them out of mm -hmm. the fridge, put a chain around it, padlock, what have you. You start with saying, keep the stuff out of the house. Mm -hmm. Don't have it in the house. If you've got a snack, snack drawer for your kids, don't fill it full of Twinkies and Ding Dongs. Uh, <laughs> it, it, yeah. Put other things, put healthier things in there. Mm -hmm. But you also then want to say, maybe instead of going to the snack drawer, you should run around the block twice mm -hmm. and come back. Uh, there are all kinds of behavior mod skills for reframing the way you experience food. I mean, get smaller plates. Yeah. You helps. know, if, if you were, were a member, if your mother introduced you in childhood to the Clean Your Plate Club, she mm -hmm. did you a massive emotional, psychological disservice. <laughs> we should not eat until the food is gone from the plate. We should eat until we feel full. Mm -hmm. For those of us that don't have the disorder that doesn't let us feel full. Yeah, and that's, that's a whole, that's that's a whole different gene. thing. The next gene is feeling full. But, you don't feel full But ever. there are strategies. You know, get a smaller plate. You, use salad plates. Use 8-inch plates instead of 12 or 14-inch plates. Put Because you put a different amount of food on there visually, the plate looks full, so you're eating less. Another strategy is don't serve food from the table. Don't fill up bowls and put on the table. Yeah. Go no to the stove style. and get some. Yeah. Uh, get um, the amount on the small plate that you need. Mm -hmm. If you finish that plate and you still feel hungry, go do something physical. Go run around the block. Take a Set a timer and take a 10-minute break. And then if you're still hungry, go back and get some more. But the odds are you won't be. Mm -hmm. You know, so you and have, it's all behavior mod. We eat too fast. Chew. And, and when we eat fast and <laughs> we don't chew. Remember when your mother chew. taught you to count how many times you're chewing? Yeah. I mean, I, first like, it was like a hundred. Math, you know, like hundred times to, to chew. Or that was, I'm like. Ugh, there are multiple lessons ridiculous. in that. I know. There are multiple <laughs> positive payouts in that. You learn to chew your We didn't again. talk as much at the table either. And now we watch TV <laughs> or we read, you know, mm -hmm. especially these, these disparate families. The kids are all texting and the parents are watching the news. You shouldn't do that <laughs> when you're eating. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But most of us do. That You're absolutely right. Yeah. And so. we do. But uh, the satiety gene, the feeling full gene, that's, that's something I honestly didn't think was a genetic issue. I mean, where people sit down and eat, and even eat slowly, and eat. I grew up, and, I grew and up, up in the country, and we didn't have high for, satiety. <laughs> <laughs> we were always hungry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh my gosh. What do you want to talk about next? <laughs> <laughs> so
so, so I have some um, family members who would spend the weekend with us and clean out the refrigerator because they were never full, ever. And yes. we were like a week's worth of groceries. Oh, were yeah. Gone. And they would eat it in two days. And they'd eat it at night. And they'd get up in the middle of the night and eat it. And they were never full. And, and I'm like, how does that happen? You know, I just couldn't, I couldn't even fathom it. Even the yeah. kids did that. So that must be part of their makeup is never feeling full. And I would hate it if I never felt full. I like feeling full, but not yeah, but too you're full. You're the kind of person that would get up in the morning and say, instead of having these pancakes, let's go for a run. Yes, you're right. Or should we eat boiled eggs? <laughs> <laughs> We're not eating. But in those days, we ate pancakes. Get thee behind me, Satan. Yes, I know. Yeah. But it was healthy. Yeah. I, and I didn't just, I wasn't born this way. I had to, I had to look at enough people who were obese and take yes. care of enough people who were obese and lift enough people to the operating table who were 350 pounds to finally go, I can't be that person. The, that is so the unhealthy. The tragedy and the sadness that people suffer when they are obese is, I mean, they are social pariahs. They have health issues. They have self-esteem issues. It, it is such an awful thing. And if you know early enough on that you are at risk for that by knowing what your genetics are, mm -hmm. and you can learn more moderating behaviors mm -hmm. to protect yourself, to make yourself safe, it, it's a life insurance policy. But I'd also challenge you to look at people who are obese and think, they have all these genes. Mm -hmm. They got a bad deck of cards dealt to them. Yeah. It is not a personality defect. It is something that they they have. You got a better and that's a deck real of cards cultural than you message did. in this society. So you you were you were blessed, yeah. and if they have that, then it's it's not your job to to make their pain worse. Right. It's your job if they ask and only if they ask to try to help because this is something that I mean it's hormonal, it is genetic, it is behavioral, it, it has everything to do with everything, but just because you feel good and you're thin and you like to run does not mean that's the answer for them. It I work, is I work a different with answer. clients that were obese who would come in and talk to me about all of the emotional damage and physical damage and relationship damage that does. But they would talk about how they would hide the volume of consumption. You know, that they would go to the quick shop and get a dozen donuts and eat them on the way home uh, because they were going out to dinner with friends, and then at the restaurant they'd just have a salad. Right. And everybody would say, oh, but why is she obese? She doesn't eat much at all. And she'd talk about how she disciplines herself. And then on the way home from the restaurant, she'd go back and get another dozen Because donuts. she was always hungry, and she was never full. Exactly. And she was emotionally eating, because that made it worse when she was, yeah. she had people judge her. I mean, honestly, I, I real. I mean, you have to look at people so differently. Yeah. So we can't make, be each other's problems either. I mean, this is a personal problem. It's an individual genetic makeup. It's an individual how your mother taught you to cook and eat. I mean, everything's it's, a relearning process. Yeah. But the biggest, the biggest lesson here is you can't judge people pers personally for their weight when you know that genetically they were programmed in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they can get out of it, yes, but they have to know how to get out of it, and that's why we're here today. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's not about judging somebody. It's not about looking at somebody well, else and I, judging, it, but, I hope not. but it's about self-knowledge. I know that I am genetically programmed to be at risk for certain things happening. I can act in a way, if, if with the right education, the right help, the right training, to avoid that risk or minimize mm -hmm. it. So I have an option to try to do that. Well, I have the obesity gene. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you go down here, there's an obesity gene. And it's, it is one that says, you're more likely than not to be obese, to have a high BMI. But I'm not, because I, I know I've been fighting that in my family, and I've yeah. been fighting that. I mean, my parent, parents and grandparents were all obese. Not my parents, but my grandparents were all obese. Yeah. So I, I know that that was in there somewhere, and it is very hard for me to lose weight. So I just have to know the rules, and th this helps me know the rules. So, so it's hard for you to lose weight. Is that a genetic thing? Is that the metabolism markers? Right. There's another the, metabolism gene in here as well. The word for that, ad a, uh, adiponectin. Adiponectin. Adiponectin is yes. another hormone that we found that, um, and this I have to. It's new, so I have to actually look at it. But if if adiponectin is high, then you don't have trouble losing weight. If adiponectin is low then you do, and mine is, and I have that gene as well. 
So I have low adiponectin and I have the obesity gene. So my metabolism is naturally low and I don't have enough of this one hormone and there's a lot of research going on about that too. So someday these will be treated with a replacement of a hormone or a blocking of a hormone or an enzyme blocker. But right now, we just have to know this is here. Right. So all of this, your metabolism, you can have a fast or a normal. They tell you whether you're fast or normal. Okay, so if you're fast, you're probably not listening to this <laughs> because you're probably burning up your calories as you, as you sit there at, while you're just sitting. But if you're a metabolic slug. Yeah, then, then you're going to have to work harder. So... It's, it's, it's why models are tall and thin. They find them that way. It, <laughs> they were born that way. Yeah, but, but it's a real challenge. I mean, to make yourself get up and do something, to make yourself go and exercise, and you need aerobic exercise, uh, get your heart rate up, to, to make yourself do that instead of eat another candy bar, eat some chips, and watch the next TV show requires a discipline, an act of will, and an act of intention. It may require loving support uh, from others to mm -hmm. invite and encourage. Uh, and accompany you while you're exercising. You may want to have company when you exercise, and, and you may want to have somebody that you want to talk to while you're in yeah. between workouts. And, you know, and we're talking about this from the standpoint of being grown-ups who make our own choices. I worry about the volume of children that I see that are already obese. They took PE out of the school and they took the the president's award for physical fitness. I remember working on that. Oh yeah. I was standing in the street throwing a softball. I didn't have upper arm strength then and I didn't I couldn't throw a softball, but I threw it until I could throw it far enough to get the award. Yeah. I mean, and then I was out walk, running around and doing stuff. Yeah, I remember stuff. in all our PE classes and we had those tests to, to get the award. Mm -hmm. you, know, you had to be able to do all these different activities, so many push-ups, so many pull-ups, pull -ups, run push so up, far, yeah. and so much time. Sit-ups. All that kind of stuff. We don't so, do so that anymore. That's an issue for children in America today, and part of that is fast food. Part of that is prepared processed foods. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked earlier no time for PE. about <laughs> you know uh, playing video games or texting or watching TV when we eat our meals instead of becoming conscious of what we eat, becoming mm -hmm. conscious of how we feel. We, we, we've trained ourselves to bypass that right. awareness. And so if that's what we're doing to our children, we certainly need to stop. But a lot of people just give up on exercise because... It's hard. <laughs> I've heard, well, first of all, if you don't have your hormones after 40 yeah. and you're female, yeah. you're not going to go exercise because it makes you more tired. Mm -hmm. Unlike exercise in general should make you have a lot more energy and feel better. So there are three tests or three genetic tests on here, believe it or not. Because I was taught a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. Right. A calorie is the same to you as me, as to Ramondo, who's, who's doing our taping. Everybody, the, cal the calorie is the same. And this proves it's not. Because I, if I have a gene for, uh, that says that I can lose a lot of body fat by aerobic exercise, then I can burn off more calories than somebody else. Unfortunately, I don't have that gene. <laughs> but... But that, that, there's, a, there's a test to see if you have the gene that, that lowers your body fat by exercising. Mm -hmm. If you do, then that is how you should lose weight, not by restricting your diet and sitting on your duff. Mm -hmm. So this helps you learn what kind of exercise is the best for you. But insulin sensitivity, we've talked about that before, we become insulin resistant, meaning we can't use our blood sugar for energy We can't because insulin carries the blood sugar into the cell. So for insulin resistant, we just make fat out of blood sugar. So if we have this next gene, which makes us sensitive to insulin when we exercise, then we can fight it without drugs. Mm -hmm. That means if you do aerobic exercise every day, then you make yourself more and more insulin sensitive. You do the job of the drug metformin yeah. and by exercising. And so that means you get more energy and you lose weight, you lose fat. So that works And at the beginning of the process, that. when you become aware of this and you say, I want to do something about this, you may need to do both. You may need metformin mm -hmm. and aerobic exercise right. That's to right. jumpstart the, the ability to make sensitivity. progress. The insulin sensitivity. Yeah. Right. But by knowing this, I look at this and I go, well, I'm not going to lose bo body fat from exercise, but I am going to be insulin sensitive. So in a way, I'll lose body fat. Mm -hmm. So that would be a good thing for me. Mm -hmm. And... And so that's why these two tests are good. And then BMI response to exercise, 
I also have that. My BMI will go down drastically if I exercise every day. So by exercising twice a week like I do, that's probably not enough. So this tells me I need to exercise, have time in my schedule to exercise every day. That's more important than anything. And psychologically, you can see that as intrusive and oppressive and frustrating. Why do I have to do this when other people don't have to? Or you can reframe it and see it as something you embrace and that you, uh, you experience uh, vivacity and energy and enthusiasm from doing and it's a matter of habituation and and mental uh, framing you got to change the perception I, I've never looked at a, at something like that mm -hmm. as as a I, I just don't look the glass is half full for me I look at it as gosh now I've got the rule book yeah I've got the rule book I've been looking for my but, rule book all this time but that's and one now of I the have fundamental it. psychological differences for you you approach the world as the glass half full there are mm -hmm. people that approach it as a glass half empty. That's true. And that makes it harder for those individuals. And that's I know. where and I don't people mean like to not me come along to, to help them. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you're a little glib and self-satisfied. Yeah. yeah, I'm not self-satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I just told you I have to go work out every day. Yeah. That's not, and I don't like to work out. I mean, that's not my fun thing. And I can sit here with my mint julep and watch you work out every day and be happy. Okay, have fun with your mint julep. I thought, saw some stuff on yours that said yeah, no mint julep. Yeah, I actually juleps. can't do that. And I'm just being a smart aleck. So, but at any rate, the summative point here is that there now are ways for you to find out what your genetic markers are and to acquire the information that then gives you some tools to make different choices and find a different program to improve and increase the quality of your life uh, in intelligent and for the most part, somewhat easy to manage ways. I mean, not easy to manage in that it's hard to exercise, and it's hard to say no if you have a sugar craving. And it's hard to change your behavior. But, but easier than being diabetic or obese or suffering the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Pay it forward. Pay it forward. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalance Health. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.